And they're different in the way they actually form. The first cave, which has got the largest chamber in the world, and it has now been declared the largest cave in the world, and we'll take a look at that one first, is actually in Vietnam. It's called Heng Son Dong Cave, right? The second cave is down in Mexico. Climate's going to be completely different. Everything's going to be different. And it's called the Crystal Cave of Giants. So let's take a look at the first cave. Now, we're going to be curious about how to take photographs. When you're in a cave, you have to have a person. You always find a person for scale, right? So you're going to see a person someplace. This person right there is six feet, right? So now you can begin to appreciate the size of this chamber. So every time you see a person, take six feet. Next thing is they have to have light further back in the cave, right? And so you have you send some people way back and put on a lot of light, so you can see the light. Gives you a feeling of depth in the cave. The cave has a lot of depth, so you want to be able to see that. And then you have to have formations around that you have to be able to shine light on here, 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 and it looks pretty nice. But you're going to do this in absolute pitch black. So a shot like this generally takes maybe an hour to two hours, maybe three hours to make, because you don't do all the lighting at one day. Right? Sometimes, let me show you some of the days I, I'd have one person stand there, and then I would do the lighting for this, then I'd go over and do the lighting for that, and after I turned the lights off, it's pitch black, and the camera's staying there open the whole time. Not recording anything in pitch black. Go around, then you do the lighting for this, and then you go around, and I might be standing there for a little while, and I'll go over there, and I'll stand there for a little while. And so sometimes these photographs, an hour, two hours, three hours to make. Right? This guy is from the National Geographic. He actually did the photography on both of the two caves that we're going to talk about. So when we start talking about these caves, you can see that this is a huge chamber, three miles long, 600 feet tall, 150 yards wide. I could fit a football from this wall over to the far wall. Football field in there, football field and a half. So we're talking a large chamber. So let's take a look at the next slide. Okay. The large cavern was discovered in 1991. It's in a very remote region of Vietnam, right? And they didn't explore it until 2009. And the first exploration got three miles in and hit a solid wall that they couldn't get over. So they decided to go one more year, 2010. They went, climbed the solid wall, but they thought it was going to go on forever, further, further, after the three months. Climbed to the solid wall, and it only went 50 feet beyond the solid wall, and it ended. So the 2010 expedition hardly discovered any new game. Okay? So it was published in the National Geographic January of this year. Right? So many of the slides that we're going to show are from the National Geographic um, slide set. So let's take a look at another one here, and we'll start off talking about this cave. This cave, when you go to Southeast Asia, they have huge thicknesses of limestone. Right? Very, very thick. Limestone is going to be made out of this particular mineral right here. It's a calcite. And one of the characteristics of limestone is that it's easily dissolved by an acid. So right here, we have a very dilute hydrochloric acid. If you've ever actually watched limestone dissolve, you can take this hydrochloric acid and it's going to drop the bottom. And you can put one drop on there and watch it fizz away. It's a carbonate, so you can hold it up to your ear and listen. And you're going to hear all the CO2 bubbles as the calcite is all the way. After you do that, take a little one of these little dabs and take it up like that and hand it to the next person so that it's not loading in hydrochloric acid by the time it gets to the back of the room. Right? Now, you really don't have to worry about getting it all over you. It's pretty dilute, 
right? But try not to get it on you. It's not going to cause problems. But if it got on your pants or something like that, after a couple of washings, you might get a little hole there, right? So it will weaken the fibers. So you want to be reasonably careful with it as it goes around. But the hydrochloric acid is really, really dilute. But it's going to allow you to see that this limestone plateau, okay, which is really, really thick, has over 300 k's in it because rainwater, when it falls, is slightly acidic. So it goes down through the limestone, it's going to do exactly what you're watching there. It's going to slowly but surely dissolve the limestone plateau away. Now, the UNESCO gave this designation as a park, and they gave lots of money, right? But it's way back in the middle of no place. And when they gave it all of this research money, because it's got a tropical forest with it, it is a real remote cave region. When they gave it all the money in 2008, they didn't give it enough money to protect it. So it sits there pretty much unprotected, except for the fact that it's a two-day walk through the jungle to get there. So not very many people are going there. However, Tourist industry in Vietnam is going strong, and they have listed it as one of the top ten designations in the world. So more and more people are trying to go to this location all the time for tourism. Tourism. So let's go and have a look at how it actually dissolves and what happens when we make a king. All right. Here's this chamber. Actually, we'll talk about cave in just a minute. This chamber could house an entire block of 40 skyscrapers. Now, take a look. There's my six foot guy. And there's the same guy. He's got a twin. Six foot back there. And there he is again. See him way back there? So I got three sets of people, probably a 20 minute height between each one. Right? Same guy. Stands there with a bright light for a while. Gives you a sense of depth to the cave. And then he had to light all of these areas on the side so he can get the right picture. Let's try the next one. Now, when you're going through the cave, all right, my first camera where I started taking pictures on a survey cave, that's me in 1967. Right here's a little uh, browser, but, uh, okay. And since you're going to be banging around, climbing up stuff and everything else, you don't carry delicate equipment. Here is an ammunition case. Inside of that is the camera. Right? You are going to be able to lug this through everything, bang it into everything. So that was a 1967 camera case when I first, on my very first survey of the cave where I was the photographer. Let's have a I had one guy who was the surveyor. They was all well, I paid back then and you surveyed the cave. We had to have people and took berries and everything else. So we had surveyors. Now I called them the blazer. Much easier than 1967 when I first started. Let's show you the next slide. So let's talk about the two types of caves that we're going to have. The first cave is going to be above the water table, right? And we're going to have disappearing streams as the water drops down through the caves, and we're going to have underground rivers to cross. Every once in a while, we're going to look down through a hole and see the water table below us, right? Because we're going to have different levels inside of this cave, and we'll be able to see. And this cave will come out as a spring. If I get down to the level that is not limestone, that water is not going to dissolve it. And then the water will flow out and we'll have a spring. And a lot of these caves that you can go as a tourist, they'll actually put you in boats. Here they are in boats, and then you'll go directly into the different caves, and you can explore the caves from boats. You don't have to walk through the jungle, they'll just put you on a boat, and you can explore all through this cave at one level. We're going to find that this is going to be a real painful experience to try to get to this first cave because the river occupies the entrance. So let's take a look at this cave in a little bit more detail. 
I think the next one will take us to the entrance. Well, as we start to dissolve this limestone away, there's a whole set of levels at which we can dissolve it away. Eventually, all of those chambers get dissolved away, and we end up with just what we call towers of the limestone left. Here is the volcanic plateau. These are all limestone towers, and we've dissolved everything away. Each one of these little towers out of the honeycomb. This is one of the tourist destinations. These are called karst terrain. This is actually a karst terrain in China, right? This one is a karst terrain in Vietnam, Southeast Asia. Here is the karst terrain. The climbers like the karst terrain. Not only is it fun to explore, but you've got vertical walls. And so one of the big climbing tours goes to Vietnam now to climb the karst terrain. So we dissolve it away. We can actually completely dissolve it away. They're in limestone plateaus that are completely gone. Let's take a look at the next picture. So here's the Vietnam. It says VietnamTour247.com. You sign up for the tour. And it says the Song Dong Khe. Where they're not supposed to take tourists in the gate. They close it, but you can still like up the dome. Right? It's just that they don't barely have enough people to make this national park and this national heritage area work correctly. They got all the money, but they can't get it to work correctly. So there are currently tours taking you to this cave. Right? Now we'll talk about some of the difficulties about getting into this cave. When you actually get to the entrance of the cave, Okay, let's try the next slide. Right? Here's the entrance. It has a huge wind rushing out of it. He led the Howard Lambert at the cave entrance. He led the survey team on the British cave in April 2009. It was unexplored because the entrance was small. The wind blowing out of it is really fierce. You start off repelling 300 feet down, and then you have two complete crossings of the river to get, and the river is roaring through this cave. So that's how come it was discovered in 1991, but nobody got past the first 300 feet until they actually put together a real cave expedition. So let's take a look at the next slide, and we'll see coming down the 300 foot rappel. Now, as we start, this is real hard to see at this scale, right? But this is gonna be the entrance of the cave. As we go down through the cave, you're going to periodically get cross sections. The cross sections are very unusual for a cave. They are really high, and they have an arch structure, which has allowed them to become the biggest cave in the world because the arch has its own internal support. So periodically, we're going to come across, and then we're going to see places where the cave has collapsed in, and there's skylights coming through, and light is filtering in from above. Those are called dolines when the cave top collapses. And we're going to see two dolines. And then when we get way down to the other end, due north, cave entrance is at the south, you're going to go due north. And when you get to the far end of the cave, that's where the Great Wall of Vietnam is. They named it the Great Wall of Vietnam. They had to try to climb it. The first expedition didn't have expert climbers, okay? So they couldn't get up the wall. So. We're going to start in here. I think the next slide is a blow up of this little section here to show you how some of the mapping is done. Oh, this is here are some of the areas we're going to start. Here's the entrance. There's Limbert at the entrance. We're going to come by. Here's the first doline that collapsed. Here's a major doline that's collapsed. And that one is growing underground form. There's enough light coming in through the ceiling at the top that it got an underground form in there. And so we're going to stop at the underground forest, and the biologists are going to work on this because there are some strange things going on in this underground forest. Okay, let's start in and do the first 300 foot repel. So here's the entrance. Then they show this, and it says there's a swim area. You're going to have to swim. You're going to cross the stream. Here's river crossing one, river crossing two. And then you're going to come and look down all the way down through the different levels, and you're going to see what's called the swimming pool, right? After that, 
You're going to go up to the hand of the dog, which is a huge stalactite sticking up in the air. Okay, stalactite, stalactite sit down. And we'll take a look at those. So they have some completely unexplored areas of this cave left. And they'll tell you occasionally that we don't know where that line goes. It goes in, it goes to the top, which means you have to take a deep breath and go underwater and you feel along the cave and you come up on the other side. And most people don't like to do that, so they're saying it's still unexplored, right? So there may be more passages than we already know. So let's have a look at the next slide. Right. Here they are. He, he's on a rope. He's just getting off the rappel. There's the underground river. He's six foot. He's six foot. He's six foot. Chances are that guy and that guy are the same guy. Right? Probably would have left it over for 20 minutes to take that swine. I, I mean, since I was a photographer, I'm really impressed. I can tell you guys. <laughs> I'll try to not spoil you that too much. It, it oh, and let's start. What? It sounds unbelievable. Yeah. Okay. Here is the first river cross. I've got a guy here. And then, see that one up there? To the light? He's six foot. I have lit the side passage over there. I've lit this passage. Lit this wall. Oh, a really good picture. When you're standing there with your headlights on, it's inky black everywhere, right? So these pictures are just amazing. They had such a good team. Let's take a look at the next picture. Now we're going to cross the river. There's one river crossing. Here, they put a rope in. Guy goes across, attaches the rope on the other side. Everybody has to cross the river on the rope. You have to be careful because the stream is flowing so fast that if you let it lose your footing, you're hanging onto the rope like now, right? Your feet are dangling down the river, and you don't have enough strength to pull your body back in and put it under the rope, right? So it's pushing on your body. So this look, he's got a hand on the rope there and a hand on the rope there. It looks like, oh, yeah, it's just a <laughs> feet. But it's really dangerous, right? You lose your footing, your feet swing out because of the pressure of the water. And then you can't get it. And you have to kind of go hand over hand with your feet dangling in the water behind you. Let's try the next slide. So those are our two river crossings. Now we're going to get to the swimming pool. Then we're going to go through the first doline for the first collapse. And see how these cross sections are? This collapse. But strange caves have that kind of structure. Almost vertical walls. And then you came around for an arch. And sometimes the arch is so close to the top, it flaps through. So let's take a look at the swimming pool. When I'm at the swimming pool, I'm going to go right to here, and we're going to look down into the groundwater level. Now, six-foot people. There's a six-foot person in the swimming pool. Here's another six-foot person in the swimming pool. They both have bright light, right? So it gives you a feeling of how high you are, right? So now. This is the next thing we're going to look at. When we dissolve all of that stuff that's gone around, everybody's got a chance to make it dissolve, right? After the water percolates down through the ground, it begins to change from an acid to a base. When the pH will become closer to 7, the pH on the groundwater was closer to 6. As it percolates down, it becomes neutral, and then it'll start to have a pH that's more like 8. This means that whatever dissolved when it went through the acid phase is going to come back out later when I get the pH. And the water is going to drip down. It's going to be saturated in that mineral. And that mineral will grow when the water is dripping down. It will grow on the bottom where it drips. And it will grow up. And it will grow from the top where it's dripping down. And I'll get the lag tight. You can remember which one's which because you want a stalag tight to stay stuck tight with the ceiling so it doesn't drop on you. And a stalag mite, you want to know that a stalag mite, you just might trip over it. It's on the ground. So these are stalag mites because you might trip over them. Okay? Now, we're getting to close to a doline. Right here where the doline is allowing light to come through. The next slide 
says that when you get to places, this is called the paw of the dog, and this one is looking straight up at the domain. What you can't see but is a rope. Rope's dropping straight down, comes down along there. Can you see the rope? Comes back around to him. So that gives you a little bit better perspective than he's shooting up. Before you say, oh, he's shooting horizontal, right? So you have to have some things in there to show you perspective. This showing you that this rope is going vertically, right? That's got to be up and down. Let's take a look at the next one. Look almost, looking almost straight up through the hanging rope. Now, I can periodically dissolve, and I can periodically deposit. As the water flows through the cave, it makes what they call scallop. Right? This scallop right here will tell me how fast the water is flowing. I can figure out the pH. The first idea was that this water was more acidic than most. And that's why it made such big passages, because it was still dissolving. When they actually got in there and measured it, the pH was way too high. Everything isn't dissolving in this case, it's depositing in this case. So that wasn't the reason they got such big cakes. When the scallops came through, and they well, actually measured the water through the gear in a minute, okay, by looking at the scallops. But the scallops are so close to the domain that light comes in and penetrates, and it's close enough that I begin to grow green algae everywhere as I get close to the domain. So this is actually like a green algae growing from the light. So they call this the green waterfall cascade. All green from the algae growing on it. Very, very interesting looking formation. Let's take a look at the next picture. Here's how I'm going to make the scallops. Right? The water is going to start off flowing right across there and it's in laminar flow. It comes off the top and it's in laminar flow. That means the little layers of water are not interacting with you. There's no turbulence to it at all. As it starts to come around here, right there it becomes turbulent, and then it gets caught in the scallop and it goes around and around and around until such and such a time that it slides back out and then it goes back to laminar flow. Right? Then, I'll we'll come into the next one. This is like number one. I'll go up over for D, then I'll come back around like that, and then I'll swirl in here. And the length of the scallop will tell me the velocity of the water that's flowing through the cave. Right? Now, it says the eddy forms, swirly water forms, water eventually escapes by laminar flow to the next scallop, over and over again. Right? So, the scallop length is inversely related to the flow rate. So if I have a real long scallop, it is flowing very slow. If I have a short scallop, it is flowing very fast. And it goes into turbulence much quicker. If it's flowing very slow, it takes a long time before it will go into turbulence. And the scallop gets bigger. So we can figure out how fast the water is flowing through this cave. Let's take a look at the next slide. It'll give you the flow rate. Oh, here are some more scallops. There are scallops sitting on the ridge. You see the scallops in here? They're pretty close together. Right? That means the water was flowing pretty fast through this cave. Let's take a look at the next picture. Okay? The cave is over six kilometers long. We're going to go and take a look at the main doline here. And it's this mini jungle is right here on this one. The mini jungle is one quarter mile below the surface. You ever run a quarter mile, 440 yards around the track? That's vertical. Right? So let's go and take a look at the big building. Okay? Now, you're a half mile away from it. That's when you first see it. Right? Here's one person six foot tall, there's another person six foot tall over there, okay? And it's, that person's just about that. So it looks like it's real close. So you have to be very careful in how you photograph it to get the proper distance. So here it says they're called collapsed olein. This is when the cave collapses inward, allowing the daylight. The chamber with the olein in the back there is a half mile away from this person. 
see person with light one quarter mile ahead. And it's really hard to see that the person over here with the light is one quarter mile ahead. Okay, let's take a look as you start to approach the dolly. The first thing that you're going to see is lots of vegetation is growing. Here's the arc shape, it's generated extra stability, not seen in most of the cages, right? And now, as we start to go into where the sunlight is, we get levels of vegetation that are changing. It's also cold in the cave. These caves are pretty constant year round. If you go down in the middle of the winter into some caves when it's zero outside, it feels warm in the cave, it's 55 degrees. You go down into the summer when it's 100 degrees outside, it's cool in the cave because it's still 55 degrees. So I'm going to be a tropical rainforest on the top, 55 degrees underneath. So let's see how the vegetation responds to this drastic difference. As we start to come closer, it says, I'm approaching the mineral forest of the Dolene. I have low light plants grouped on individual scallop ledges. Let's take a little closer look. See those? Burn, low light plants, the biology, and they're cold plants for the most part. They're not warm plants. So they study this because there is something that's really interesting about plants that they don't quite understand compared to animals. Animals like worm animals, right? You can't adapt to a new environment. I don't care how long you lay in a bathtub, you're not going to grow gills, right? But it's in our DNA not to have gills. But let's take a look at what happens as we come up onto this thing. All right, the next slide is going to show me a forest. That forest right there has the tree up in the rainforest where it's really hot has exactly the same DNA as that tree right there. But the tree down here where it's cool is deciduous. It loses its leaves in the winter. It's colder. It goes into a dormant state. The exact same tree up on the top with exactly the same DNA is year-round. No loss of leaves. It's not deciduous. The tree is adapting to the changes in the environment. Plants can do that much better than animals can do that. And here is a great example. Why is this really important? We are worried about climate change. The animals aren't going to be able to adapt nearly as much as the plants can adapt. So, adaptive. Here, let's go to the next picture. Now we're going to be in the forest. Okay? The doline has captured a river. Remember, we're talking about Dolene. So there's waterfalls coming into the Dolene on the side. This picture here, see this guy right there? He is standing on that rock right there. When he's standing on that rock, there's the waterfall in front. The other guy's standing back here for the picture. And he's looking across through the waterfall and down into that hole. Right? So there's a six footer, there's a six footer, then he's got some lights way back there, he's got some lights way back there, and you begin to get perspective of death, right? And that's both there. Very out of so impressive these four as you can tell. Okay, next slide. Here's the guy. Plants can adapt to new environments without a change of species. Same tree species is deciduous in the cave because it's colder. And then when the sun goes down a little bit in the season, it's got so many walls on it that it becomes in the shade in the winter. So it gets less light and it's colder. That causes it to be deciduous. A lot of people say, it can't be deciduous. It's controlled by its DNA. Plants don't have to be as strictly controlled as animals by their DNA. So lots of study on these plants and comparing them to the top because it's not very often that you take the same species and put it in such a different environment that it can evolve in that environment differently. And so we can do that in this case. Next picture. We're going to go on past the Dolene. We're going to leave it behind. And the next picture kind of shows us leaving the Dolene. Right? So there's the Dolene in the background with the big forest. Very nice arch shape. And they're, again, six foot. So that's pretty far away, right? 
Um, let's go to the next picture, and we'll show you the next thing that they did that was very interesting to look at in the cave. Okay? It becomes the largest cave because it has the highest continuous room, right? That room is over three kilometers long as a single room. It's the widest continuous room, and these are the only stable conditions because it, they, they couldn't figure it out. The reason it happens is because there's a fault right there. It is growing in the fault. The fault is sheared up the bottom of the floor, and so when the water rushes through at a higher speed, it erodes the floor. Not only am I chemically eroding it by the acid rain, but I am actually physically eroding it, and so it gets vertical walls, and I'm in the fault zone. Those vertical walls support it better. Right? Most caves don't have absolutely vertical walls. So they figured it out because of the fault nature of the and it's absolutely straight north south. Most caves weave all over the place. Let's take a look at the next picture. As we go on further into the cave, we actually see the difference between erosion and deposition. These are called cave pearls. The cave pearls, remember we said the water was three miles per hour, that makes the scallops. Then, during the dry season, the scallops will end up with pools of water in them, those pools of water will evaporate, and so they'll make a deposit. So I'll scallop by erosion, and then I'll deposit around little things, and we get cave pearls. All of these cave pearls were growing in evaporating water that was held in by the scallops, right? But it gives a very artistic looking. So here, water three, p three miles per hour during the wet season, stationary in pools during the dry season, and suddenly I get both erosion and deposition in the same picture. Let's try the next picture. Here's the Great Wall, okay, of Vietnam, 250 feet high. It ended the first expedition because it was virtually unclimbable. Second expedition, when they came back to the second, they had expert cave climbers. So let's take a look at them, see what they see. All right, here they are. They bolted their way up. They're drilling bolts, putting them in. Now, perspective. That guy right there is six feet tall. See him? Right? So you're looking down, 250 feet. He's almost up to the top. Right? They climbed the wall. After they made all this thing, oops, the cave ended. Right? Nothing went on beyond it. Now, we're going to compare this to the second cave. Okay, second cave, this is Southeast Asia. It has a massive limestone. It's got monsoons to create lots of rain, acid rain, and it creates many cave systems inside of it. The second cave is very unusual. It's almost the opposite. Let's take a look at it. First of all, the Crystal Cave of Giants is on the vault, which is nice, and that's similar. It's under the Chihuahuan Desert of Mexico. When you get to the surface, I don't have rain. It's not rain from above that's going to cause this cave to form. It's going to be some other source of water. And when the water evaporates in these cracks of the vault, it's going to deposit a mineral called gypsum. Right? This is going to be gypsum. We'll pass this around in just a minute. So I'm going to have completely different stuff than the calcite that we gave you earlier. Let's take a look why this cave forms there. When we actually take a look, it is going to form huge crystals. These crystals are going to be 35 feet long. The size of this room is just the size of the basketball court. Look at the size of the crystal. Six foot, six foot, six foot, six foot, huge crystal. Okay? Let's take a look at the next slide. Here's the Chihuahuan Desert right here. Here's Texas. There's the Big Bend, right? Um, first time I was actually introduced to this area, I had taken a group of students down to Big Bend, and right over here, is the Chihuahua Desert, that's where our case is uh, here, but it is inside of a mining zone in the fall. They are mining gold, silver, lead, zinc, and they're mining down deeper, 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 
and you're in the mind. The mind is in the fault zone. And they, when I was taking the hike in the Big Ben, the people would leave the mind, come across, and sell you minerals. They sell you some of the minerals you bought. Okay? Lead zinc deposits are famous for the mineral called fluoride. So well, let's take a look at that one. All right? Oh, here's the here's the belt. There's the basin and range. Here's Nicaea, I think. Nicaea. Nicaea is right in here someplace. Let's show you the next slide. Okay, some of the minerals. Beautiful fluoride. You can buy nitro fluoride. You can buy nitro fluoride. Here's purple fluoride. You can get good galena. Some of you who are in physical geology have seen these minerals, right? In the lab, you've seen the fluoride. You've seen the uh, galena. And I don't think you see the fluoride. This is the zinc ore. This is the lead ore. And filtering through that little tiny crack is pure silver. I think I got that on the next slide. Right? Pure fibrous silver in some of the cracks. Right? There's another piece of fluorite and another piece of sphalerite. But when it comes in the cracks, it's called wire silver. And that's what they're after. They get the most money for the silver, second most money for the zinc, and then the lead. So let's take a look at the cross section of the mine. And now the cave of crystals is well below the water table. That doesn't mean you have to mine the scuba gear on. You have to pump the mine really hard and make the water table decline around the mine. And they're going to pump, what, 23 gallons, 1,000 gallons a minute. All right? Because Tong Dong was above the water table. This one is below the water table. All right? Now, let's take a look at how deep below the water table it is. I think I've got a little bit of tiny, tiny little cross section to show it to you. Oh, we're going to show you the limestone first. Here is a picture from space. The picture on the left is just, I took it from Google Earth. I wanted it to match the satellite image, so I just adjusted Google Earth until you can actually see there's NICA right there. That's the entrance to the mine. But when you're from satellite, you can say, I want to take a picture that's not the visible range of light, but I want to take a picture that's in some other range of electromagnetic radiation, and then I'll false color image it. And all of this yellow under the vault is limestone. So the cave had to occur in the limestone. This dark red is fields, farming fields. They're growing crops. How are they growing crops in the middle of the desert? Remember, we're pumping 23,000 gallons of water out of the mine per minute. Well, I just spread it out on the land right next to the town and let everybody grow crops out of that mine. Right? So I have farm fields right in the middle of the desert because of the mine. Okay, so let's take a look at the next picture. So you drive for a half an hour down the road and it's all wet. There's puddles and everything and water dripping around. And you drive, you're pumping, I said 23 gallons, 22,000 gallons. Off, right? <laughs> 22,000 gallons of water per minute draining the mine shaft and the cave so you can actually go down below the water table. Right? And not have to scuba dive. Let's take a look at the next line. Here's the entrance. You're going to drive for a half an hour through a bumpy road, okay, down through, and then you're going to be laid down. Let's take a look at the next one. Here is the cross section. There was the original water table in that dashed line, 120 meters down. And then the desert is way down there. All right? Then, after we start pumping, here's the current water table. This is allowing to mine all of those veins of the ore body for silver, lead. Right there, they crossed this fault to see what was on the other side, and they ran into the cave of crystal. Right? Turns out that this water is fairly acidic, so it's still dissolving. Right? Let's take a look at the next picture. Uh, keep going. 
but look at the thing you see in this picture. Okay, when you go into there, you know, it's going to be extremely, extremely hot. These people look like they're wearing suits from outer space. In fact, they are wearing an equivalent because the temperature in there is 120 degrees. The humidity is 100%. So your skin doesn't do what it's supposed to. Your organs don't do what they're supposed to. You could, you could sweat like crazy, but nothing evaporates and takes your heat away. Your life expectancy without a suit is 15 minutes in there before your organs shut down. Now, so they put a suit on. The suit has ice in there, it has a blower that goes across the ice, it cools you, it comes into your mask, and your life expectancy with the suit is one hour in the day. Right? Now, they make you only stay there. They give you a little leeway in case you slip and everything. So they say you must come out after 30 minutes. Right? Or but so your suit's going to start stopping after maybe 40, 45 minutes, and then you've got 10 minutes, maybe a leeway of five minutes before you're dead, right? Because your organs are going to shut down because these are extremely awful conditions. So here they all are in their various suits. So that's why they look like little orange ants crawling around. Let's take a look at the next picture. A small opening leads to the queen's chamber, where the crystals are the largest, and these are the 35-foot crystals. Let's try the next picture. 35 feet long. Okay? 35 feet long. Oh, right. Now, the crystals are made out of a different mineral than that one. It's called gypsum. The variety is called selenite. The reason it's called selenite, when you buy this, I just bought this one. It's because you can set this on a little thing and plug it in and the light comes out and it glows. Have you ever seen these in little curio shops and things like that? You set it right there and there's a little light disc underneath, a little box, and it glows. And it glows like the light of the moon. Selenite is named after it because the Greek god for the moon was Selen, right? And so they named it after that, right? So this is a selenite crystal. We're going to pass this crystal around, and you can take a look at it. You can hold it up to the light. If there's enough light in the room, you'll be able to see through it. It glows very nicely. The next picture shows us the next characteristic of selenite. It's soft. These corners can be very sharp, and they can cut, but it is really soft. This mineral is so soft, you can scratch it with your fingernails. So I've got a couple of these pieces right here. And when you scratch with the fingernail, don't scratch like that. Say that for your little brothers, okay? When you scratch, take your fingernail and go the long direction of your fingernail. You go across like that. You put some nice scratches on the surface. And you'll see that this mineral is so soft, you can scratch it easily. So we'll pass the gypsum selenite around, which is what these crystals are, right? So that's why they're named that. But they are not resolved. Okay, by an acid. They actually can precipitate in an acid. This line has fairly acidic water. So I can't deposit any slide type because they would dissolve away. Let's take a look at the next picture. Temperatures in excess of, we said 120 degrees, 125 degrees, plus 5 degrees, plus or minus 2 degrees. Okay? Humidity 99 gives you a heat index of 200 degrees. Okay? So one of these explorers, this one right here, is from NASA. They were looking for life in the cave. They found life in the cave. They found it inside of one of the selenite crystals in a bubble. Now, we know most life requires sunlight, but there's life on the bottom of the ocean for the thermal vents are, okay? We've grown the light, real exotic light down there. They have not done all the DNA sequencing on it. But NASA was really interested because these conditions are as close as we can get on Earth to some of the conditions and some planets inside of our solar system. They want to know if life is going to exist on Mars. If can life exist on Venus? So this is the closest 
concentrations we have on Earth. So NASA sent this team down to take a look for life, and they found it inside of some of those elements. The reason it's so hot is there's magma chamber right down underneath them. It's only a mile to a mile and a half down. And that's the supply of all the heat, and that's where the circulation of the water is coming from, is the magma chamber. So real nasty conditions, but really great for research on Earth. Right? Both of these two exotic caves are researchable for exactly different reasons. Climate change and exploration of the planet. The president. We got about five more minutes. Okay, yeah, I'm just looking to the floor. Okay. Any extended time period within 10 minutes requires air conditioned suits, ice cooled air supply, that's why they're all looking that way. Right? We've already told you about most of this. Let's try the next picture. Now, core samples are tested for isotopes. So I look at the different isotopes of carbon and so forth. Right? I can get an idea how old they are. So they take this little core thing right here, they drill into the very center, and then they watch the isotopes change from the edge to the core, and they can see how old the crystals are. These crystals are 500,000 years old that they began to grow. They have been growing continuously for 500,000 years until the mine pumped out the water. Right? So, the next thing is, how can crystals, if the water is moving very fast and it starts to become turbulent, right, then lots of crystals grow. If the water stays laminar flow, then one crystal will continue to grow and grow and grow and grow, and the other crystals won't nucleate. So we know that the water moves through this cave at laminar flow speed, not the other cave where it flows through fast and they all look solid. This one, let's show you the next page, or the next slide. Okay? The crystals were actually growing up till 2000 when we pumped it out. The mine is slightly acidic, therefore there's no calcite in the cave whatsoever. Right? And the next picture shows the fact that the was moving less than three inches per day. The water would start here, 24 hours later it'd be there. I can need to show stay in laminar flow. Laminar flow has no nucleation, so single crystals that start on the side can grow all the way through the chamber. So they all start on one side, go all the way through the chamber to the other side. So they're like needles going through. Let's show you the next slide. Hydrothermal fluids come off the magma. Now. I'm going to deposit sulfur rich and hydrite in the fault zones, okay? So the water re dissolves those and makes the hydrated form. So let's show you the next slide. We're almost to the end. All right? Cave solution stayed at 120 degrees Fahrenheit in the range of gypsum. This is calcium sulfite with water attached. We actually dissolved the calcium sulfate. And then when it got re-precipitated, it's outside of the range of the anhydrite. It stayed just barely in the range of gypsum. So that's why gypsum grew. Let's show you the last couple of slides. We'll go through those pretty quick. All right? Researchers could work for nearly an hour at most. Tourists check in, check out. They are making big bucks. You are closely timed in and closely timed out. Let's show you the tourist picture. You can write Nicaea. Next slide. They have a new entrance. They've renamed the cave. They changed it from Crystal Cave of Giants to Cave of Crystals. They have a new observation area where you can stay on one side. You open the door to go in, and you go in without any protective suit. You're allowed 10 minutes. Let's show you the tourist blog. You can put this into a blog, and many people want to have pictures of themselves in that setting right there. Largest crystals on Earth. Let's show you all the pictures that you can find on the blog when you put in 19. New tourist industry. Obviously not a scientist. Okay? <laughs> probably not a scientist. Probably not a scientist. Probably not a scientist. Right? You pay enough. They'll take you down there. Okay? And these are different blogs where you put it in. 
And they're obviously not scientists. Let's take a look at the next, I think it's our last picture. Oh, more. Ah, uh, look at that. Look at the smile on his face. Look at me. I'm touching the biggest crystal in the world. Right? <laughs> next picture. The big question is, okay, we'll keep going. These are just different laws with different people who have been down there. You pay enough, they're going to take you. There's somebody over there. The question is, should this pain be preserved? Okay? Or should we stop pumping when the mining is done? Caves should refill and crystals would start to grow. And this one here is an hour long talk, okay, that National Geographic did. And then there are blogs, people fighting over whether the cave should be preserved and they keep pumping the water out, allow the farmers to keep farming, even if it's all lined out. That's very expensive. But people seem to be paying, going to pay big bucks to go down there and get fish. Weird combination. Fine. Piggyback to us too. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Um, I want to know exactly how much weight uh, does puck, uh, like one of the uh, big crystals? Oh. Uh, I don't know that they've actually had a way to weigh them, but I'd say they're going to be six or seven tons. Right? For one of those crystals? Are they made of silicon? Or do they? No, no. They're calcium sulfate. Or that material right there, with that you can scratch with your fingernail, called gypsum. They're made out of gypsum. And when you're in lab, like if you're in one of your lab, well, you're going to remember that it hardens too on low scale. It's a common mineral. I asked because, you know, it's still not selenite. It sounds like it's selenium. Exactly. But it's not. Yeah, you know, um, do you know, model these flow rates? I mean, it's like a Yes, all of that's been done. I can actually give you a reference if you're interested. They did it and they studied it at the Cave of the Winds in Colorado Springs, which was the first actually developed the numbers. And you know, those, 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 uh, those scallops in, the, uh, in these caves, there's some sort of soil forming there. It's not, it's usually oxysol. You know, it's that, it's that deeply oxidized, bad for growing things. But down there, Something different going on. I mean, like, you mean even where the building was? Yeah. The whole like, head head head. Head. Oh, like something that's rich, uh, organic rich, you know? Um, that part I don't know about. I don't know about the quality. Yeah, it was. Very, very interesting. A lot of questions that I don't really answer to. Just the question answering one of those as well. I'll just say I don't know. You can go there. You can go there. Okay? Any other questions? Oh, it's been fun. So I want to quickly show them the calcite and the um, gypsum up close. Oh, you know, there's a sure. little camera here. Okay. See, here's the... There we go. And for those people who are going to watch this on the video, let me stick this up. Is that high enough so you yeah, can see it? Good. That's good. Okay. Yeah. Now let's put a drop of acid on it. See it bubble? Can you see the bubbles forming? Uh, I don't know. It might be a little green. Okay. Oh, you can hear it fizz. Let's try that. Is that the microphone? That's the microphone. Oh, that's yeah. this one. Can you hear it, Fizz? Okay, well, maybe you yeah. can show the bubble again one more time. Okay, the bubble. Okay, well, now I know where it's at. Maybe I'll just turn it over, try it again. We'll put it on there, and it looks like there. Can you see the bubbles? Okay. Well, we gave it a try. Okay. <laughs> and the gypsum. Yeah. Want to hand me the gypsum crystal, please? Selenite. There it is. <laughs> What's that? Is there any license on the underground rivers? Yes. A lot of license on the underground rivers. Mm-hmm. Yep. Pretty. Okay. Pretty. And then we'll show you one more thing. Okay. We'll take this one. We'll stick it up about like that. 
and then I'll take my nut fingernail and we'll put a scratch in it. Did it show? Yeah. Wow. Very soft, but very sharp. So you could actually stick stuff in your fingers? Or you get cut on it. When you're walking around in there, you, you put your hand down, and it's sharp enough that it'll cut you. But at the same time, you could scratch it with your fingernail. There's a difference between being sharp and being soft. Yeah. You want to get most of that? I do. I'm going to give. Sure fish that one out um, I've done the Okay. Then give a because he